Growing up in the food desert, it was really difficult to make the decisions to eat healthy because the options was very limited. From block to block, fast food chains, different liquor stores. I'm going to these doctor visits, they're drawing this blood and everything, and they're telling me that my levels aren't quite right. And I'm like, well, you know, I just had a burger. High in sugar, high in salt, high in calories. I just, I just ate some shrimp, it was fried. Had a couple of pieces of potatoes on the side of it, you know, da 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 da. You can't just put fast food in underserved communities. That cannot just be the rule of thumb. Um, everything was swollen, everything hurt. childhood was everything to me. You know, with my dad committing suicide, it was about the community and the village. And that was the one thing that Cativo Drive, you know, was there for me. And right out of graduation, like four months later, I got hired at LaFace Records with L.A. Reed and Babyface. My first record I ever worked was Players Ball from Outkast. And then I hit the road with Tony Braxton, got to work with Usher and TLC and toured the world. And uh, once I left uh, LaFace Records in 2000, I moved up to New York City. So I left my beloved Atlanta and I was in New York for almost 10 years. When my dad committed suicide, it was in the house that I was born in which is in Dixie Hills. So this house represents a fresh start for our families and they all pool their resources together because Cativo Drive was like, you know, kind of a cool street to live on. People were starting to talk about this neighborhood and they were building out a lot of homes. And my mom was like, you know, I want somewhere better for my children. And so they all pool their monies together. And that's why this house is the foundation of me because it was a new beginning. How did you, how did you find out about the house? So I got in touch with my best friend who introduced me to Shanti, mm -hmm. and uh, which we've been knowing each other for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And she told me that um, her mother was selling the house. Uh, so she was like, was I interested? And I told her yes, and she had me meet her sales agent over. And that's all she wrote. Because you know, I was telling them I'd pick you up and go dance. I know. And didn't even know my <laughs> wife was down the street. <laughs> They don't do it like that no more. What I like about the neighborhood is that people that are here has been here since the 50s and the 60s when these homes were built. And now that their kids are coming back, they are helping them with the home, with the area, trying to keep it the way they had it when they was here. What was so rich about Cativo Drive and about Southwest Atlanta is we always showed up and showed out for one another here. So it's really incumbent upon us to come back to this neighborhood, right? To make sure that we're helping to bring about the change that's needed so that, you know, healthy lifestyle is there.
I've got to come back and be a Goodwill ambassador for the city. I can't just rep Atlanta and not give back and not contribute, you know, to making sure that my community was going in the right direction. So I wanted to really weave myself back into the fabric of the community and of the city. And so I just quit cold turkey. I walked away from a $500,000 a year job, corner office. I had the Range Rover, you know, the lifestyle, right, that everyone wants. But it was time for me to come home. Even as great as Cativo Drive was, we would go out to Greenbrier, to the Greenbrier area, which is still in Southwest Atlanta, but it's about 15 minutes from here. And then sometimes we would go to Mapleton, which was about 20 minutes away, just to get a grocery store that had a lot of options. You want to cook. Right. Coming home from work. Yes. How far out do you have to go to get fresh fruits and vegetables? Uh, approximately about five miles. Five miles. Five miles. Five miles. Right. In the heart of Atlanta. Yes. Five miles. Right. It's no wonder that you find, you know, a high concentration of diabetes and high blood pressure in some of our African American communities because we just don't have the access to that. Well, mostly it's uh, just two hamburger joints, uh, a lot of fried foods, which is unhealthy, uh, package store, service stations that are not providing certain things when you go in, into them. Um, it's just, you have to just drive. And, and guess what, what if I didn't have a car Trying to take the bus, you know, you might have to get on two or three lines, you know, and it would take you all day, you know, to get to a good grocery store and have better options. So, you know, I just want to make sure that our generation is coming back over into this neighborhood and making sure that we're pouring back in and helping them, you know, to get the right options that they need. Otherwise, everything up there is just pretty much bad for you. You have three convenience stores within a quarter of a mile of each other, and they're all selling the same thing. It's almost like you can't blame the people in these communities because that's all that they see. Now we do have a, uh, a elderly person. She's a she's the president of the community. Mm. She uh, puts flyers in the mailbox to let you know who has passed, who has illnesses. So I imagine those flyers probably mention stroke. Yes. High blood pressure. Yes. Heart disease. Yes. Diabetes. Mm -hmm. I would imagine. Because for the majority of people, it can be prevented. Raising awareness, I think that's the number one issue. A lot of times they just need the education. They need to understand what their risk is and how to modify their risk and to change and have healthy behaviors. My neighborhood is 100, the neighborhood that I grew up in, 100% black. And good eating is bacon. Good eating is yeah, fried, food, fried, fried food, you know, french fries. You know, it's ridiculous that you have to go to South Cobb or to Camp Creek, you know, to have a nice restaurant. But we can have a McDonald's and we can have, you know, a random wing spot or all the soul food spots, which are great, don't get me wrong, because soul food Sundays mean everything. But we cannot have soul food every single day of our lives. What can we do about that? We can talk to, to people that, are, are, that own these, these, these health food stores and let's start putting them in underserved communities. If we're serious about attacking this thing, from not only a financial, but also a health standpoint, we gotta be serious, we gotta be, not just talk. We need to come back and get them out and get them active in the neighborhood. You know, making sure that certain laws get passed so that, you know, they can have access. So it's hard to tell people, no, you can't eat that at all. So you can educate people on, you know, the benefits of maybe eating less of it in moderation um, rather than a giant meal. So portion control is important and then 
substitutions, ways to still enjoy the food that you love, but in a healthier way. The most empowering part of this story is how the community owns it. It's not a sob story. It is a, this is how we own it, right? right. Like, we have all these solutions in place. We walk at certain times. We do this, we do that. Mm -hmm. Choose to be better, choose to make a move, choose to do what you need to do for your children. Everything else will fall into place, especially with the help of the American Heart Association. Just so grateful and full to be able to come back here and be a part of this campaign and you guys are really bringing me back home so that I can make a difference.